Good evening from, uh, from our headquarters in Kyiv. This is the Sunday show at Vomatsk International, the only prime time TV program and discussion explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm in English. And I'm Natalia Humenyuk. This week, we all who are in this studio traveled to Mariupol, to the south of Ukraine, it's just some kilometers from the front line zone, to the first event of this kind. That was the first investment forum and the first unity forum devoted to the Donbass reintegration and investment to the uh, conflict zone, uh, and the first activity organized and initiated by the Ukrainian government since the start of the war of this kind. There were many, many uh, discussions, uh, in, in, in fact, in Kyiv and international devoted to geopolitics and security, but there was none uh, devoted to the economy or the humanitarian issues. And we're happy to discuss that with uh, Daniel Bilak, the chairman from Ukraine Invest, which is the government's investment promotion agency. Also, uh, Oksana Lemishka, who is Ukraine Program Lead Center for Sustainable Peace and Democratic Development. Oksana has presented the uh, study on survey on the social cohesion in Ukraine. Lena Kozarny is the CEO and founding partner at Horizon Capital. Lena, you were moderating the discussion with the Prime Minister of Ukraine Sorry. there in Mariupol. And Ivan Versyuk is our uh, beloved guest and the journalist from Envoya, who also traveled to the uh, investment forum, um, which was named Rethink. Maybe I would like uh, to show also when we are ready to show the map to explain to our guest of the show uh, how w where we were and what's unique about this uh, about this particular event. Uh, but before that, probably um, let me know. You know, conferences, shows, conferences, forums. That's quite a usual thing. So I think a lot of our audience uh, members like go to the places. What was special? You can start. Uh, thank you, uh, Natalia. Wonderful to be here. It was um, it was a, it was actually quite a unique event. Um, I mean, I, I, I've done hundreds of these over the course of the last three years in different places, and and this one was very special. Uh, obviously, I'm a, I'm a bit biased because we had a, an important role in organizing it uh, under the direction of the office of the president and uh, the prime minister's office. Um, but, you know, it, it, had a, it had a real vibe to it. It had a real energy to it that you don't generally find. It wasn't just another conference, uh, if you put it that way. Uh, one uh, senior official from the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, said he felt like he was in Davos, walking around Davos in Mariupol. And I thought, wow. That's for a guy like this. This is uh, that's a pretty that's a pretty important statement, and um, and I don't think it was just blah blah. I mean, there was I think part of the energy that uh, that was being generated uh, was as a result that people were actually looking forward. It was a forward-looking conference. It was it was it was uh, there was a lot of optimism, cautious cautious optimism. Um, but, um, you know, people, there was a good buzz about it, even on the, on the plane back from Zaporizhia, which was filled with <laughs> people from the conference, uh, they were still talking about it, and, and, that, and, that, and that's pretty good. And Alana, you've been moderating the uh, discussion with the Prime Minister. I probably need to add that the whole cabinet uh, had traveled to, the, to Mariupol uh, in order to, to the south town um, in the Donbas in order to have also the meeting, but they most, most of them have been available during two of these events. Um, so uh, do you think that was like a satisfactory, have you gotten satisfactory answers to your questions? Well, yes, I, I definitely feel that we did. I mean, we, we asked all the questions that you know, I'm also chair of the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine, so all the questions that our members wanted to hear and wanted to hear answers to, we asked. Um, but I want to just step back for a moment and say the fact that we had this conference, this forum, that really President Zelensky announced as his first investment forum, and it covers all investments, not just investments in eastern Ukraine, but all investments. The fact that he held it in Mariupol is really big. Because you can organize something like this in Kiev, we go, Dan, all the time to these conferences. But to organize a conference like this with 700 guests, 200 journalists, at that caliber, 30 kilometers from the front line in Mariupol, I think it was outstanding. And, and that, like 100 plus CEOs to show up. Exactly, I mean, that, exactly. That, that was phenomenal. People from London, people from Washington. We had lots of people from, from Germany, from Europe. Uh, I think it was very, very well attended. So definitely. The investors I talked to were satisfied. It exceeded their expectations. They were a little nervous. Some of them had to get clearance, special clearance to be there from headquarters. 
they were they did get that clearance. They came and they left quite satisfied. What's your take, Elon? Uh, uh, I think that the Rethink Investment Forum was uh, very important in that sense that it brought a substantial amount of hope for Mariupol and the Donbass. Because for long years, Donbass has been quite a hopeless place for many people living there, for youth, for middle class. Once you graduate from university, the uh, only two career options you had is either you go to work uh, for some uh, coal mine or you go to a steel plant, and that was it. And, uh, and uh, the, what investors were saying is that the Donbass economy needs to be restructured, and that it has some agriculture potential, that it could be technology industry uh, vibing there. It could be uh, some modern economy, digital economy, and it will bring new jobs, a new education as opportunities for the Donbass residents. And this is quite important because hope is clearly something that Donbass lacks. It's been living on government subsidies for the last five years, and this needs to be changed because Donbass is a rich and very important region. It could be economically successful, just it needs a little bit more attention from the global investors, a little bit more of these investments, and maybe some uh, very smart policy on how these investments are done. I want also to show to those who doesn't know where Mariupol is, where it is exactly, so you can understand, in fact, what why we are so, let's say, all a bit impressed. Uh, so please show the map, as I already said for a few times. Uh, that is just 26 kilometers. It's the biggest town in the southern uh, Ukraine near the Donbas. It's, uh, as you see, uh, the, 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 you can see the, the, this red dot, the contact line. So if you look close, it's almost there. Uh, and now it's the second biggest town in the... Uh, Donetsk region, it's also uh, quite far away uh, from, from wherever we are because there are little trains, there was a new road built. Uh, however, it's the biggest port in the Azov Sea, which is also crucial to the economy. But uh, I would ask also, um, Oksana, you stayed for the second day uh, because I think that it's also important we will discuss it uh, in, in, in the program. Uh, uh, what is also your impression? Because that was uh, devoted more or less to the humanitarian mm -hmm. issues, to issues like pensions, education, and as well like uh, difficult issues of the transitional justice, um, how did you, which probably hadn't been discussed at this level so far. Yes, actually the second day was, was called Unity Forum and it turned out these were the two separate forums. And the first day everything forum made us all also see Berdyansk because uh, all hotels were so booked that some people had to travel to other cities. Speaking about Unity Forum, uh, we also all of us were cautiously optimistic because probably it was the first attempt to discuss such a challenging topics uh, for integration of Donbass, of humanitarian issues in, in one room. Uh, we had ministers present, uh, we had President Zelensky himself been present. So this level of discussion in one room that would tackle multiple layers of the challenge is so much demanded and wanted. And yes, I would agree that choosing a place like Mariupol is not only showing that there is capacity there, but also people by traveling there understand a little bit better what the region is telling us. I want we listen for two quotes of the uh, international officials. This is the Christian Danielson, who is a director general for European neighborhood policy and enlargement negotiations from the European Commission. As well, there was the first public appearance of the ambassador Taylor, charge de of the American embassy here. Uh, we couldn't talk about the American policy, uh, politics uh, there, but the, he was very happy to discuss the event and uh, why it matters. Well, I think it's a very good uh, initiative and you can see around that it's very visible with all the people that has come here from Ukraine and uh, various parts of Ukraine, but also from uh, partners outside. I'm personally from the European Commission and, uh, and we are, of course, very active in this area, supporting uh, various forms of infrastructure investments as well as civil society and uh, the decentralization and anti-corruption. So for us, this gives an opportunity to discuss, to meet and also to see new partners that we can work. So the United States would very much like to help on the whole peace process, and so if we can be supportive to Ukraine, um, um, if, if they would like to have our support, you know, we're, we're eager to do that. 
that's the that's the kind of political support that, that we can provide. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, important at this time where there are some real possibilities. Um, we've had five years of no possibilities. Um, and now we've got a president who seems to be interested in doing something soon. What has changed? There's a new government here who ran, the president ran on his top priority was ending the war on, on Ukrainian terms. Um, and he's been willing to do things differently from the previous president. He's been willing to take some risks, even at the risk of some political backlash. Um, take some risks to get to, to come to a, an agreement. He's also been willing to deal directly with the Russians, and that had some results. You know, had the prisoners released a month ago. Um, so, so I think there is a new opportunity for, for progress on the So it was a quite a positive discussion. However, I would ask, still, I have, I've talked to some people, uh, and they said, like, mainly journalists or the Ukrainians coming from Kiev, not the foreigners. Uh, and they said, like, mm, but what if Russia attack? Why to invest in the region so close to the front line? Uh, that, so how would you answer that? Have you, how did you answer these questions? Well, I think the initiative that President Zelensky announced, which is the International Partnership Support Fund, is intended to, to address that concern. I mean, if we look at private investors and where they're investing, they're investing in agriculture, IT, many export-oriented businesses. Um, and often those businesses may be in Western Ukraine, may be in Kiev, down to, down to Odessa. Um, of course, in renewables, you have it across the entire country. That's a big uh, investment. But we do believe that, that donor support is necessary to, to rebuild Donbass, to help with the reintegration efforts when that moment comes. And World Bank, together with the president, has launched this fund. That's very big because, you know, donors need a vehicle, a trusted vehicle through which they can support the Donbass region. And I think that gives them that. The I mean, we confront this issue all the time, uh, for, especially from European investors. And um, I think that there is a certain degree of understanding now of the situation. It's now been uh, five years. Uh, we've settled into a, a situation that, uh, that has more or less stabilized. And as Lena says, the, the president has now taken an initiative uh, to try to, uh, to, to, to resolve this. Um, when you look at, at the economic opportunities uh, in Europe, Ukraine is starting to look very, very good. I mean, we are the largest emerging market in Europe of any significant size. And that, you know, my pitch has always been that our greatest assets are brains and grains. And people are the, are the resource that everybody is looking for and looking at everywhere in the world. And we have some of the most talented and smartest, brightest people in, uh, in the world. And, you know, everybody has this narrative, oh, they're all the Ukrainians are leaving, etc. Actually, we produce 130,000 engineers a year, where the average European country, large European country, produces 22,500. And those engineers stay here. And uh, this, is, this is really the foundation of, uh, of, uh, of the new Ukrainian economy. Uh, Ivan, you were covering this story as a journalist. You, you had a chance also to talk to many ministers. They uh, were quite available. You know, that's always have to, good to have the whole cabinet in the same room <laughs> and every journalist can come. Uh, but, uh, you know, there were numbers of memorandums signed, but, you know, like you, people are clapping the memorandum is signed. So, for instance, I can name just some of them, like pre-financial agreement for Kherson regional roads, uh, some, for instance, uh, memorandum which was quite big, uh, that was on the preparation of the Ukrainian railway for initial public offering between EBRD, so it's going for the, um, uh, and the Ministry of the Infrastructure and the Ukrainian railway. But, you know, is it, uh, you know, can, can you explain, explain how big is it? Did also the ministers answer your questions, uh, the ones you are, up the, which uh, you are bothered with the new cabinet? Uh, uh, several uh, positive things were said. 
For instance, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky's message that the Privat Bank won't be returned to its former owner, Igor Kolomoisky, was crucial for many investors because the Privat Bank issue is something that the International Monetary Fund looks at when it makes a decision to uh, fund Ukraine with a new program, no matter how big it is. I mean, if it's only even $3 billion, so that's still uh, very meaningful since all the investors are looking on whether Ukraine has the IMF program or doesn't have. Well, the Prime Minister Alexei Honcharuk said that the key obstacle for investment in the Donbass as well as in Ukraine is high amount of risk. Risk is Russia, risk is oligarchs, and then risk is judicial system. And he said, we'll bring those risks down. But he didn't explain how he's, he's going to bring those risks down. Because once, once an investor looks at opportunities in the Donbass, he, he looks at, I mean, he doesn't want to risk a billion of dollars if he's, he's going to lose them. So uh, the message needs to be uh, more precise, more logical, because you just can't tell I will, I will bring down the risks. You got to say how you're going to bring, bring them, <coughs> them down. But then, before we get to the different topic, you mentioned the question of the private bank. Of course, it's huge. And we also had a chance to talk to the vice president of the uh, EBRD, Alain Piu. Uh, he more or less said uh, the same things on the stage. We just elaborated more, in particular, what expected from the government in, in this regard. Presidential administration has stated a few days ago, uh, during a G7 uh, ambassador's meeting, that uh, regardless of court decisions, uh, private bank will not be returned to its former shareholders. So we welcome that uh, statement. Uh, we would like uh, simply to understand better, you know, how this would be done in practice. But we welcome the statement. But the second point is that, as you know, uh, the management of, uh, of a private bank and the board of the bank have uh, launched a number of lawsuits in various countries, in the UK and in Ukraine in particular, in order to recover the assets which evaporated from the bank. Uh, a very important decision was taken in London uh, recently, uh, which uh, confirms that uh, the British uh, judicial system can look at the case. Uh, in Ukraine, there are cases as well, which are in the hands of a number of uh, state institutions. Uh, and we expect these uh, state institutions to do what has to be done in order to progress these cases in Ukraine. Well, uh, if I uh, remember correctly, NABU, uh, the SBU, are not uh, courts. They are uh, law enforcement uh, agencies, and, um, and uh, therefore, you know, we, uh, they, they basically, you know, depend on the state, and they are expected to do their job. So we expect them to do their job. That was uh, said by the uh, head of the, the vice president of the BRD that it's not enough to say that the courts uh, shouldn't be influenced by the president. There are particular issues. Did you also mention that many questions were on the private bank on the sidelines of the forum? I can't say that I heard so many questions on the sidelines. Um, I believe it was in the president's opening statement. It was in the prime minister's. The prime minister said, if anyone hears of anyone who's saying that we're going to not insist on it or, or somehow give private bank back to former owners, then, you know, raise that. You know, look, I think, I think they, they said it head on. Um, that was also Timothy Ash's last question when I was moderating the prime minister. Everybody knows it. It's out there. Everybody's watching. It's under a microscope, what's happening with private bank. And everyone's seeing what happens when the IMF comes. In a few weeks, the IMF will come. Our understanding is that is the, the, the crux of the remaining issues relating to before we can sign an IMF agreement. Yeah. So, you know, let's all watch. Let's see what happens in two weeks. And I think the answer is going to be fairly clear very my, soon. My father always said, if there's an elephant in the room, introduce it. <laughs> that's and, right. uh, and, I, and, I, and I think that's exactly what uh, both the president and the prime minister yeah. did. Um, and they basically said, here's the statement. Uh, this is what's going to happen. It's not going to happen, and let's uh, let's move on. And 
you know, uh, I think that everybody's everybody that I spoke with is prepared to take that at face value. It, clearly, the IMF is not just about getting more support for the budget. The IMF is really the litmus test about, right. you know, it, is Ukraine going to uh, move forward and integrate further into Europe and European, further into European structures and, and, and the EU. So, it, you know, the, the, I think there was a very clear message from uh, at, the, at the highest levels of the Ukrainian government uh, that we get it, we're, we, we're, we're, we're on board with the IMF and we're moving forward. But then I still want uh, also to hear, you mentioned Timothy Ash, who was asking this question to the Prime Minister, but he also liberated to Hromatsky. Uh, what exactly, as he believes, the international partners expect again from the, from the government and why it's so critical for the IMF deal? I think the first challenge, the key challenge, is Privat Bank. You know, there is a, a legal challenge to the nationalisation. Uh, clearly, there is efforts by the former owners to take ownership back. Um, you know, the future of Privat Bank, and I think uh, any move against the nationalisation would be a huge risk to macro financial stability in Ukraine. Um, the nationalisation happened. I think there was a very good reason to nationalise the bank uh, back in 2016. There was a huge hole in its balance sheet. It, it posed a huge systemic risk to the whole country. The right decision was taken. Um, that's the reality. Uh, if they hadn't have done what they've done, you know, Ukraine wouldn't be in such a good position as it is now. Um, but the, you know, basically, the government makes, needs to make a decision: what happens if the courts rule overturn the nationalisation? What's plan B? Actually, the gentleman from EBRD was very clear-cut in that, saying there needs to be a plan B, and what about asset recovery? You know, if the courts determine that there was some uh, illegal activity uh, involved in the original failure of the bank, the, gut, the state suffered a huge loss as a result of it, $5.5 billion. At the time, it was more than 10% of, well, actually, it was a five, more than 5% of GDP of the country. Um, why should the state take such a big loss? And actually, it's not just Privat Bank. If you think the banking failures between 2015 and 2016-17 uh, cost about $15 billion. So it's, you know, the state needs to go after the former owners of banks that, in the end, uh, took money from depositors. There's no other way. The Zelensky administration has a wonderful opportunity for transformational change. They can deliver. Prime Minister Honcharuk has spoken about 5 to 7% real GDP growth a year. 40% real GDP growth for, over the next four years. It's possible. It really is possible. Um, so that was a good, uh, you know, ending note from Timothy Ash. I also would remind you that the full version of our interviews you can find on our webpage Um But we, why it's all happening? It's of course a lot about investment, but it's a lot about the reintegration because the the growth in the economy is something which is uh, moving also the, the country forward, but also can ease the relations uh, between the territories which are occupied so close to the place we were. So I want to give a, uh, the 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 floor to Oksana and who presented this marvelous uh, research and there was a graph in particularly on the support for different occupied Donbass reintegration scenarios and that was the rare data from occupied Donbass uh, gathered in 2019 uh, by your agency and that's what we can see you probably would elaborate but I would announce that we're speaking that yes 27 uh, percent agreed to become a part of a Russian Federation this both are agreed. Yeah, yeah, so it's like yeah. the both to mm. rather agree and totally agree. It's more than 50%, but it's almost 50% total, the people who want to remain the part of the Ukraine with the special autonomy status. And um, we have all together, because this is a rather agree and agree um, now, over 40% people who want to become independent state recognized by international community. Uh, but there are the, also the considerable number of people who are ready to remain a part of Ukraine subject to decentralization. And very few who want to have the status quo, to have the situation as it is now. Uh, how we can read this as well, just also explain, because this is a data... <coughs> You know, like th there was no special information campaign made in order people think mm -hmm, differently. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Uh, this is indeed the fresh data from the non-government controlled uh, areas. We held face-to-face uh, -face interviews together with our partners and before I will comment any further, we would we have to remember all of us that uh, commenting and using this data, we have to do it with extreme cautious because this is an area very difficult to reach for any surveys and this is an area where it is very difficult to control the collection of the data. At the same time, we have a sample of 600 respondents and this scenario would be for us uh, an area of topics we should be aware of when we discuss reintegration uh, in Ukraine. Uh, this is a representation of non-government control areas and the fact that uh, becoming part of Russian Federation is one of the most popular scenarios gives us an idea of why we should not forget about these topics. This is like an elephant in the room that should be introduced. Very often people forget about discussing this, the other popular ideas of reintegration. At the same time, our data shows that um, every scenario is dictated from insecurities which come from personal life. Uh, economic security is very important. That is why investment forum is playing such a big deal in the area. People who, do, who are afraid of economic insecurity, personal insecurity and political insecurity, they would be looking for the scenarios which are popular in the air. This is what the data is saying. And I would also ask, want, to, uh, want you to explain this uh, another uh, graph which is about the negative view of people from the West, uh, pro-European, and you were speaking why also the economy plays such a huge role. So I want that you really comment on, 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 on that graph. Um, so, yes, indeed, in our school methodology, we look into how Ukrainians like each other or not like uh, each other. So we have these uh, different stereotypes and groups. And um, why I love data as well, because sometimes it gives you surprising uh, results. For example, in this map, we can see that uh, what are the drivers, what are the reasons of why people from the East are more open to the dialogue with, uh, with the Western Ukraine. And you can see that some are very expected, like social tolerance, uh, believe in human rights, and then some social skills and the idea of, of openness the dialogue in general, but one of the reasons why they can be open is actually the satisfaction with infrastructure and social services in the East. So we see that the group of people who are happier with infrastructure, with the new road, which we all took to, to Mariupol, and if you're happier with social services, you will be more open to dialogue with people who support European orientation and people from the West. Which also brings us back to the investment uh, issue. Mm -hmm. So, in the end, what do we get? I, I think that one of one of the uh, crucial outcomes of uh, uh, both the recent electoral process as well as the uh, this conference has been the importance of infrastructure as a key driver to economic growth. <clears throat> the prime minister uh, talked a number of times about getting to uh, uh, forty. Uh, uh, percent uh, GDP uh, uh, growth over the past over the course of the next five years. Uh, everybody, without exception, said that this is possible, but it's highly challenging. This is five to seven percent growth year on year. We need to have massive investment. That's not going to be available just from the private sector alone. We need to have some public-private. Uh, uh, interface in order to do this, and that's large infrastructure projects. We have not been able to do public-private partnerships, which are which are really the big drivers in 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 economic in investment growth, investment into economic growth, uh, because we didn't have the legislative framework for doing that. In this, one of the results of this turbo regime of uh, of, uh, of passing laws has been the passage of the uh, concessions law. And this, is, this could really be a game changer uh, for Ukraine uh, as a gro not just an economic growth driver to reach those, those uh, uh, objectives, but also as an integration program. Because we, we, you know, the days when we could sort of say, well, we could play Russia off against Europe and we're somehow in the middle, it's gone. And I think everybody understands that, that we have one, where, one place to go, that's West. And we have to bolt ourselves into uh, Western uh, both security as well as economic infrastructure uh, architecture as, uh, as, as soon as possible. So, just like, where, what were the major concerns raised, to your opinion? Uh, I, I think a, a big problem is that you can't solve all the Donbass problems simply with money. Even if you pour like billions of dollars even the Donbass, there are still problems with people's mentality, with mood. I mean, I felt very clearly that there is so much fear in, in Mariupol about the future of the Donbass. And then the, the education, right? 
uh, you, uh, when I talked to the locals in Mariupol on the streets, I asked them, what do you think about the investment forum, about the, all the investments? And their feeling was like the perfect investment would be if every resident of Mariupol would be distributed 10,000 bucks in cash. That would be a perfect investment. Uh -huh. But investments just don't work this way. They, they need some a certain amount of private initiative from locals who would uh, ask for loans, who would ask for grants, who would propose some projects. And I clearly see lack of this private initiative in the Donbass. That's, that's a huge problem. It's all about education and mentality. So th these challenges need to be tackled. I would have a bit slightly different question. Uh, for you, having all of you, in particular you, Lena and uh, Danielle, in this, in this room, you worked lot also on the same issue with the previous government and w which we know as well like many things had been achieved before for instance in case of EBRD they mentioned that like many of the things have been planned for years it's not something which just happened like there would be a record year for investment from the EBRD this year however it was a long plan it good it hadn't stopped at all it didn't kind of slow down uh, still what is the difference for you to work with the there was a you know, like there is a part of the Ukrainian society which is very cautious with the new government, extremely cautious. Well, look, I, you know, I think I think Dan feels the same way I do as well. That um, that you're working with institution, and for foreign investors, institutions are everything. So when we're working with the president of Ukraine, it's with the institution. When we're working with the prime minister and cabinet, it's with the institution. So we we work with institutions before we continue to work with the institution. Um, look, I think I think we often say that it is now or never. You know, this government has a mandate. The prime minister, the president, has a 73 percent mandate from the people. He was able, he's got an absolute majority in parliament. He's got the prime minister and cabinet that he put in place. And really, I think people feel it's now or never. You know, structural reforms were started. More was done in the last five years than the 20 years before that, the 22 years before that. Um, but now they've got to put it over the finish line. They've got to deliver the structural reforms that are go going to catalyze that growth. And what Dan said in terms of, you know, they've put a, a very big goal. 40% GDP growth is very big. We've also heard the number $50 billion in foreign direct investment. $50 billion. Okay, I think that's reasonable because we did have a, a nominal GDP of $230 billion before 2008, dropped to 180, dropped to 90 billion, and now is back up to 130. So we aren't even near the nominal GDP that we had in 2008. Now, I think we can get there with the 50 billion, but going back to what Dan said, infrastructure is key. I do believe, you know, money is key here. I do believe that, you know, it's a driver. It's, it's a driver. If you look at Poland, when Poland joined the EU, every region got $2 billion of EU investment. I mean, that transformed the country. It's not just, you know, there's a roadmap, but, but one thing that I do want to say that, that I want people to pay attention to is the memorandum signed with the French government and the Mariupol City Council for 100 million euros for the water treatment center. And I think, and that's my dream, is that really you're going to see that roll across the whole country. I mean, the entire country. From east to west. From east to west, exactly. But the fact that Mariupol got it done, that, yeah. that Vadim Boychenko, that the mayor got this done, I mean, it's not easy to do, you know, pre-feasibilities, feasibilities to pull the deal together for 100 million euro water treatment facility. That's big. Water treatment, sewage treatment, recycling. Imagine every city across the country. That's the kind of infrastructure that can be catalyzed. Yeah. I yeah. If, if I can, I mean, um, I think that uh, Lena mentioned the word transformation, and I think that this is really crucial that we appreciate that we only started really building this country five years ago, mm -hmm. and that more has been done in five years than the previous 22. No other country has gone through the transformation that Ukraine has in the last five years anywhere. And when you look at that, that is, provides a real solid grounding for this, this government. What, what we've seen is that for lots of different reasons, but there seems to be more hope. And when there is hope, and this is across the country, that, 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 that's, a, that's, that's, a key, that's a key driver. I think that in this transformation, what's really important in terms of this institution building, because Ukrainians have never, Ukraine has never had its own national institutions. We're building them from scratch. We never had our own government. We never had our own parliament. We never, never had our own judiciary. 
Right now, our, the constitution of the Ukrainian economy is the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement and our free trade agreement with the, with the EU. Because this is what is pouring content. All of the boring rules and regulations that of the EU being poured into our new institutions. But that's what gives investors comfort. There is one reality check story I want to show everybody that is not about the big business, but that's a part of the Hromatsky series. We're traveling to the you know, small towns and villages across the front line and talking what's there happening really, also with the small business. And I think sometimes it's um, bringing this back information to this, to this studio. And therefore I want to introduce, and in fact, you know, though are you doing these big things about the macroeconomy, to also show the story of the um, Natalia and Serhii from uh, Stanisa Luhanska, a small village, a town just on the front line uh, for whom it's easier to go and do business in occupied Luhansk. Uh, you see this small, small name, Stanisa Luhanska, near Luhansk, and the Severodonetsk is currently the capital region of the Luhansk region. So, of course, technically it's closer to go to Luhansk, however, it's about the crossing line, and um, that's quite a powerful story I want everybody to see as well, you, and then we probably slide into our, the second part of the show. Наша позиція була однозначна, ми виступали проти встановлення блокади. Воно не принесло е, тої, тієї мети, е, яку декларували. Ми підтримуємо все, що стосується захисту національної безпеки і оборони. І якщо блокада буде потрібна для такого захисту, то ми готові її підтримати. Возвращатися к этому вопросу нужно, но для этого нужно виконати ряд е, других действий. Блокада Донбасу допомагає послабити агресора. Торгувати з окупантом не можна. Що? Це знаєш, пісов за піс, що, да? Вір во всім мірі. Ты смотришь, как она растет, наливается, и у тебя это получается. Такой думаешь, ой, какое счастье, боже мой. Сереж, иди сюда, она зацвела. Наташ, иди сюда, смотри. А вот тут первая ягодка. И вот так вот мы все время живем. Даже в условиях вот этой блокады, вот этих всех боевых действий. Мы так и живем. Четырнадцатый год, когда более или менее перестали стрелять, началось, так скажем, перемирие. Мы начали выезжать в Луганск. У нас другого выхода нет. Абсолютно. Ездить в сторону, опять-таки, Лисичанска, Северодонецка, да, туда. Дороги ужаснейшие. Так, дайте прийти, да? Иди. Захожу туда. И погнали. У наших городских. Да. Ну, то что, вот это ж, сейчас выбираем, да? А время к шести часам идти на переход не знаем, пускает, не пускает. К чему еще сегодня прицепятся, скажи, пожалуйста? Да. И... К весу, не к весу, к малине, не малина, что, в банках, не в банках? Ой, я не могу, у меня просто вот прямо... Так, все, все. Пустят. Мы ж не уйдем. Будем настаивать на своем. Это наше. Это не ворованное, не куплено, не купи-продай. Не барыги. Упрекают нас в том, что каждый раз вы кормите сепаратистов. Да не кормим мы сепаратистов. Все. Все. Получается, сепаратисты могут кушать 75 килограмм плавленных сырков, а... 10 килограмм, 20 килограмм малины они не могут кушать. Они сразу превращаются в сепаратистов, а когда едят колбасу украинскую, они не сепаратисты. Ой, 
ой 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 куда людей? Малина не проходит сразу. Нет, 10 килограмм. Почему? А, пробу снимать, снимайте. Знаешь, почему? Потому что ягоды вообще не знают. Почему? Ягода не предусмотрена приказом, поэтому предусмотрена. Нет, вы с собой чуть-чуть можете взять. Мы не, 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 не. Пропускайте. Выйдите, пожалуйста, к нам. Выйдите, пожалуйста, к нам. Что вы там спрятали? Выходите сюда. Чего вы прячетесь? Вот на тушу можно, да, вот это, да? Можно? Вот он, да, для себя везет? Или кому он везет? Вот кому он попер от этого сыры? Вот, я выращиваю лично, вот этими руками, с дочкой, с семьей. Вот я буду каждый я день честно сюда говорю, ходить, каждый день мы, сюда, да, мы ничего, едем сюда. реализовать, потому что рынка сбыта здесь нет. Я не Его могу, я только есть, здесь что не говорю, было, я, я не могу. Скажу. Меня, когда я вышел в школу заканчивать, меня учили нет. говорить правду. Ну как можно, блядь, вот скажите, вот объясните, блядь, так, что мне, блядь, делать, а? Вот что мне, блядь, делать? Тихо, тихо. Что, скажите мне, что делать? Тихо. На голову высыпадим, блядь, или что? Тихо. Вот объясните мне, что мне делать с ним, блядь, а? 19 у нас начинается, у всей станицы начинаются большие проблемы, большие неприятности с заработком. Они подрывают вообще всю экономику нашей станицы, реально. Если это блокада, да? Блокада. Здесь То пусть эта блокада есть, будет вот, вот вообще блокада. То есть проходят okay. люди с сумочкой. Все. А другого источника дохода у нас нет. Что дальше? Когда ты целый день здесь находишься, ты трудишься, ты на что-то надеешься, а тебе стоят люди и стараются как-то тебя унизить, чем-то оскорбить за твой труд. Но становится очень обидно, очень обидно. Ukrainian. So that was the, the video we showed, uh, and I should also say that after the report a bit later, the berries were included into the list. There was a quite a short list of what is allowed. And now, in particularly at the forum we were, the Minister for the Veterans and the Temporary Occupied Territory said that instead of the list which allows, which is not the full list of to what to bring through the checkpoint, they would make the list of what is banned, which is easier at least that, 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 that would make. Um, and therefore we're passing to the second, second part, and maybe then Oksana, you would probably also say that why you think it's critical, this kind of the thing, uh, like solution of, the, of these kind of a small issues. Uh, I would say this is they a, are not small. In yeah, fact, like this is a very big issue because one thing is the mental, like the, the the blockade, economical one, but the other is the mental blockade which Ukrainians are putting on each other. We have a big problem of understanding each other, listening each other, and uh, having a problem of a mutual dialogue. Our data shows that we still have stereotypes: east about west, west about east. So I would show you. We would like to show. Yes, yeah, you would explain for us, for instance, the graph which is called about the unified Ukraine narrative. The unified Ukraine narrative is a very interesting graph, but the most interesting part about it is that the, the no, it's, a, it's a graph showing different attitudes to uh, what is the conflict about. Is it about uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine, or is it between so-called DPR or uh, LNR uh, territories? But the rate, it, and also the data is from 2018 and from the Ukraine territories. Um, and uh, the interesting is a don't know rate. Uh, people um, don't know what is the solution they are looking to. There is a vacuum of the scenarios of reintegration in general. There is a lack of understanding where the country is going as far as reintegration issues are concerned. And this is something which uh, 
started to be um, told about at the Unity Forum, first time maybe in such a loud manner. And people are not afraid to talk about scenarios of integration. And I was very happy that from our um, perspective, the research organization was invited to see what are the real issues that have been discussed in the East, because we have this, this group of people who feel marginalized, like political security, who don't know what are the scenarios, what each of them entangles. So um, this don't know um, area should be filled in with, with meanings. This is one thing. And the second one, the biggest group that Ukrainians are afraid to talk to is not East, is not West, is not even a pro-Russian group. It's people from the non-government controlled areas. And we see our data shows that it's a nationally accepted scenario to be close to these uh, territories and not to talk to them. And this is the, the culture of dialogue we should change. Because without talking to, to the woman that you just showed us on, a, uh, on the TV, without entering into dialogue with all parts of Ukraine, we cannot communicate and verbalize the scenarios for the future. And uh, this is for me, it was very surprising that we are ready to talk to separatists, to pro-Russian people, we are ready to talk to all the groups, but we are the most close to non-government controlled territories, which are our people. So this is the culture that I would really encourage everyone to, 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 to think twice about and to be more open. Um, and I would probably also, before we start, because I think like that, that probably also the challenge part of our show now, because I said like you were doing the, with the, a lot with the economy. Mm -hmm. However, it's very hard to separate because we don't, what, what for us is interesting, you don't want to have the same people dealing with the conflict resolution or human rights activists talking to each other because we talked to each other for many, many years and how to make this, this discussion kind of broader. I think this is I think this is a very important uh, uh, aspect, and I and I agree a hundred percent that this this is a di there needs to be a dialogue. But we I think we need to put all of this in context. I mean, th this has all been done artificially, right? I mean, we were invaded. This is a trauma for the country. I mean, it's like being cut, and your body goes into shock, and you really don't know how to deal with it. So. And, and at a very crucial time, five years ago, we were, we were at an existential moment. We didn't know whether we were going to have a country or not. And uh, in a very real sense, I mean, our economy was one step away from collapse. And I, I think that at this stage now, we've got macroeconomic stability, which, we, we, which is very hard won. And now we have to enter into this second phase, which I, I think is, is, is you're, you're, you're very correct in saying that we need to figure out how are we going to bring that hope and generate that kind of economic activity at the local level? We have to get, we talked in, in general terms, but we also have to get very granular. We have to get down to small, medium-sized businesses. How are we going to support people in Stanitsi Luhanska? How are we going to support people in Dobropivlja, in, in, in Mariupol, in getting their businesses going to create a market for their goods locally? Nobody's going to come around like uh, Svete Mikolai, like Santa Claus, giving away packets of $10,000, right? That's not going to happen. But going back to using people skills, Ukrainians are incredibly creative people, uh, and uh, whether, wherever you are. And, and I think that that kind of coming back to Lena's earlier point about these funds, about, you know, it, it's not about dispersing them to big steel mills and, and coke producing factories, etc. It's about getting very, very granular and, and producing SME sectors that can be financed. The biggest problem of SMEs across the country is, is not the lack of people willing to start small businesses. It's about having the proper funding to allow them to have working capital, the financing, etc. And that's where the, the efforts have to come. And that problem will go away. And I want also you uh, watch a short uh, part of the speech by the President Zelensky, uh, which I find myself quite historic because everybody wait, what is the plan about reintegration? So he more or less announced some of the few steps with a clear name that it's not, there is no one answer. This is the part of the very complicated discussion. And if somebody, if there is one person asking, you know, what's the answer, I won't give you one. Um, uh, but more or less, he pointed out some of the priorities. Mm -hmm. 
The international experience of armed conflict and war in any part of the world describes three main steps that can lead to a successful cessation of war and the implementation of peace, all of which are necessary and should be taken consecutively. The first step is ending the hot stage of the war and implementing a ceasefire. We are sure that we will absolutely achieve this in the near future. We really want to do this. This is a very necessary, important, but to be honest, it's only the first part. The second required step, the reconciliation of people, the search for consensus. How much time do we need for the wounds to heal? The third mandatory step is secure reintegration of the territories, not just on paper, but in reality. There's a lot of real-world examples where the sharp stage of a conflict was ended, and there was even partial reconciliation, but the important parts weren't completed, namely the return of territory. They remained in some other status and weren't returned, unfortunately, to this or that government. Does this sort of option work for Ukraine? I think not. But the question is rhetorical. We will have to go through these three steps together, the government, society, and every citizen of Ukraine. This forum is the first step to creating a public and regional think tank in order to find answers to the most important and difficult questions. We're talking about the fate of the state itself. We've never experienced anything like this before, never. And therefore, not a single politician, I'm sure, not a single expert or civil activist can pride themselves on having successful experience in this matter. And no one has the right to say, I believe, no one has the right to say, I'm the only one who knows what's right, only my view is correct. We don't have the right to say this. We need to listen to each other, and all of the tough questions need to be solved with a sober head, without political slogans, and to approach these questions with the interests of Ukraine and her citizens at the forefront. So it was like an announcement of this kind of na national di dialogue. Did you feel it is this start? Yes, for me, uh, we, we started five years uh, ago, but this was sort of a, like a mark, uh, like a stem of the, uh, we, are, we are going on uh, in the same pace. What's your reaction? You weren't there, but you heard these bits. I mean, I, I, I think these kinds of uh, initiatives are very, very important. I mean, it provides a forum, a platform for, for this kind of a dialogue. Um, you know, if, if anybody's looking, I even have a candidate to, to head this up, uh, Hugh Mingarelli, the former EU ambassador to Ukraine, who headed up a similar fund in the Balkans, which, you know, was uh, a good, good preparation for the Donbass, uh, if, you, if you like. And, and, and I think you need that kind of outside support, somebody who can, who can actually walk the corridors of power in, in the EU and in, 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 other, in other countries and has that stature that, uh, that uh, working together with the president and his team and the government um, to, to, to make this happen. We need, we need to build a consensus around, uh, around this. And with all of the stakeholders, this cannot be a just the Ukrainian government initiative. And I think this is one of the narratives um, that we talk about consistently is that to Europeans is getting them to understand that Ukraine is on the front line of European security, their security. This is a civilizational war with Russia, and they need to understand this, and that the, the economic, uh, just like the Balkans, the economic stability of the Donbass is vital to European national security. Uh, I liked what Daniel said about the Balkan Fund. I know that Montenegro, after the war in the Yugoslavia, its infrastructure was rebuilt with American money, and then Americans would place money in the media projects in Montenegro to produce fair coverage of what's going on in the country. Same could be done to Donbass, because as far as I understand, media in Mariupol, in Kramatorsk, uh, they are not really independent in, in, in true sense of this world. world. So uh, media is, is also important. And uh, thanks to the Rethink Investment Forum, Mariupol is now back on the business map of both Ukraine and Europe. So investors who came from London and the United States, they would report to their offices in uh, Washington, in New York, uh, in uh, Paris, wherever, that there is Mariupol, there was a certain amount of projects you could invest, these are the projects, these are the sectors that would grow, and now that there was support of uh, uh, world development banks, and this, of the IMF, of Horizon Capital, mm -hmm. and, and this, is, this is important, people would know more about Mariupol, Mariupol and see it not as a uh, frontier of war, but as a place to invest into the business. 
I want also to give another command uh, for a person who largely known in Ukraine but totally unknown uh, internationally. This is a new advisor to the Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council, Serhii Zepoho. Uh, that uh, could be by some skeptics uh, perceived uh, you know, in a different way because Serhii Zepoho is a famous comedian. However, he is himself from uh, Donetsk, an extremely popular persona in particularly among the people who stayed in the Donbass. So kind of this, for some people, dubious uh, position, uh, it's maybe not understood by many international but clearly understood by the people from Donetsk. This time yesterday we were in Petrivsky village, which is preparing for troop disengagement. The Prime Minister was there. Although our conversation started with other things, namely people complained about land tax, medical service, we constantly heard that people want a troop disengagement and that people want peace. Those are people who live in this territory. They haven't just arrived there. They are there, and they want disengagement and peace. So uh, I would remind that in this studio and in our news, we provide a lot of uh, stories also about the uh, protests which are taking place in Ukraine. However, we got also this map for support for peace talks as opposed to military operation as a way to resolve the conflict. And Oksana will help to explain it again. This is my favorite uh, map to end the presentations with hard news. Uh, there is consensus in Ukraine that uh, we should proceed with the, with the peace uh, talks uh, scenario uh, only. And despite all the misunderstanding and, and closeness to dialogue and maybe stereotypes, there is a big consensus that we should continue with peace talks rather than resort to any military solutions. And this is a, a very hopeful uh, message to all of us. And uh, I would say we should go on with this mode. And I think this is a good way to round up the uh, round our discussion and thanks a lot for helping us also to combine two stories because i think in this particular case they go hand in hand you can't you know have an investment forum without talking about the the difficult and complex issues you know uh which are also maybe sometimes humanitarian and as well without that the as, as we just understood all the other understanding won't happen if you don't have roads and that was probably something good as well like if you don't have roads you, it's very hard to um, unite the people so thanks a lot uh, Ivan Versuk the journalist from and where our great colleague uh, Lena Kazarne who is a CEO and founding partner at Horizon Capital and as well Oksana Lemishka Ukraine's program lead center for sustainable peace and democratic development and we would pro also when you have a chance to uh, see the surveys of your organization so uh, watch uh, them and as well Daniel Bilak who is a chairman of Ukraine Invest thanks a lot for being with us Good. and uh, discussing uh, that was great and um, I also say like follow us on Twitter and Facebook so Hormatsk International sign up for a weekly newsletter and as well support Hormatsk International donate as we are independent media and we are more than grateful and dependent on your support that you can also do uh, while going to the right top uh, side of our web page and thanks a lot for being with us and uh, we'll be back uh, in a week with the show however uh, we are there for you working 24 7 so stay tuned and with this uh, thank you from the entire team of Hermask International and goodbye <laughs>